Stadia is holding steady, the pixels are percolating, and the OnePlus X may become a thing again. Sort of. This is the Android Police Podcast. Oops. I realized that I don't know. I have I cannot hear the opener myself now. So I don't know what okay, is so playing. Just go just, ahead. Yeah, we're just gonna assume the music has ended or it's or it's not. It won't really matter. Anyway, you'll edit this now. It's Monday, December 9th. Welcome. I'm Cody Toombs alongside Jules Wang. We've now heard that uh, the OnePlus X is pretty much getting a successor. It's a little bit late. It's happening down the road, but it's a thing that's happening. It's going to be called the OnePlus 8 Lite. Uh, renders from 91 Mobiles and on leaks have come out showing off this, uh, this new phone. They're going to be doing a rear camera bump that includes uh, two cameras of course, the uh, the typical flash, and off to the side, there's going to be a time of flight sensor. It's going to have a roughly 6.5 inch OLED display running at 90 hertz, and uh, frankly, it looks a whole hell of a lot like a Galaxy S11. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's all you can really say. Um, not many other details have uh, come out about this thing, so the obvious correlation that everyone's going to right now is the OnePlus X. Like, this is the first time that OnePlus is, uh, rep- uh, purportedly, is at least, going back into mid-rangers. So I'm wondering what they what they need to do to hit the right notes here, because already you're seeing the 90 hertz display, the time of flight sensor. Um, they're kind of starting to wonder where they're going with... Um, uh, the hardcore specs because there's still a certain expectation for them to hold up. Um, I don't remember what they used for the OnePlus X. Was it was it that uh, 810, 808 generation of Snapdragons? Oh, honestly, I have no idea. Um, to be perfectly honest, I didn't... I <laughs> The OnePlus X came out and I didn't even understand that it was a mid-range phone for a few months. It wasn't until somebody made some offhand remark about it and it's like, wait a second i thought that was like their expensive one at <laughs> which point i was corrected and it's like oh okay well the naming just doesn't sound like that type of phone uh but yeah i mean just to look at these renders and to be fair renders are just renders we don't really know exactly how accurate these are going to be to the final product but uh you know on leaks has a pretty good history for this sort of thing so they'll probably be pretty close and just to look at these, it still looks kind of like a flagship phone. Uh, it's hard to tell for sure what the material is going to be, but uh, if it's not plastic, I, it I imagine you know it's going to be reasonably an expensive body for manufacturing wise. And uh, I agree. I'm kind of wondering where they cut corners. Yeah, because... VGC, thank you very much. Uh, Snapdragon 801 on the OnePlus X uh, there. And I remember uh, having been at Pocket Now and then when seeing Michael Fisher's review of it is that uh, it had this very, you know, it, it was a plinth of obsidian or at least ceramic, but it was like a very, it was very slippery and it, like they didn't really shy away from that exterior. So, I mean, I'm, pretty confident in saying that they'll at least keep some sort of metal or at least uh, uh, what they've been doing. Maybe modify it a little bit because the light will be kind of special. But uh, you'll if you've seen it on the 7 and 7T, then it's probably going to be something like that on um, this 8 light there. Uh, and um, yeah, it's uh, like I'm curious, again, are we seeing 6 gigs of RAM being the baseline here? Like, I know that... Uh, six gigs there have been very limited qual- uh, quantities of uh, those SKUs in the most recent uh, phones so th- they've been really more uh, relying on eight gigs as that baseline um, so maybe that will be it uh, I don't know if they will really uh, want to go with the 765 route. Uh, I know that that's what Qualcomm's trying to push. I know that 5G is going to be 
a big thing that uh, that chip maker just wants to do. But um, in terms of like when OnePlus is going to make its decisions and when it's going to come out, not sure if uh, timing is right or if pricing, frankly, will be right for that. Yeah, and really the price is, to me, the biggest question here. I mean, any specs that they choose, honestly, like, sure, they're, they may not be the very top end specs. Obviously, they won't be. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think they're going to put out something that is massively compromised. They're going to put out a decent phone. I, I do tend to think they're probably going to drop down to six gigs of RAM. Uh, I mean, if the pixels can get away with it, so can OnePlus. But, uh, yeah, I, you know. I, I would expect a decent phone to come out and it seems to have otherwise probably pretty good, pretty good components going into it. So this seems like this seems like kind of a return to early OnePlus phones where it's not technically flagship, but kind of gets close to it, but still at presumably a much cheaper price. Well, um, see, here's the thing with the uh, Diablo in the chat pointing out that the Pixel 4a, if it comes, might probably have competition in this thing. And um, I think already OnePlus is trying to patch up its uh, kind of lost fan base, uh, more price valued uh, fan base when they've left for uh, brands like uh, Oppo's Realme. They've been doing a lot of... Um, more value for punch kind of phones. Um, I'm trying to remember all the others. Iku maybe from Vivo, and uh, I said Realme. Um, I think there are, there are a couple more out there. Honor maybe one of them. Who knows? Um, it's just the market there is so stratified out in places where we aren't. Uh, we're mostly U.S. publication, but. Uh, talking about Europe and Asia and they they're not insignificant uh, markets at the least uh, you know that's saying a lot so I mean that's something that oneplus has to contend with I'm not sure if uh, much will be thought of in terms of having to serve directly at least the US in general but um maybe that yeah. 90 hertz thing is gonna do well i don't know and now that you bring that up uh it, it is worth wondering it will this actually be available in the u.s will it be will it be seeing a, a fairly worldwide release or are they going to be fairly geo-restricted because not every oneplus phone is actually making it out to every market anymore that's something that they've shown is now part of their reality so uh, we may we may get a couple surprises there I guess yeah. we'll see. I mean, when you know, flavors of the world, you could say, uh, coming together. But I think the strategy is key here, and um, yeah, that's it. We'll, we'll have to see what goes on. Uh, in the meantime, I think uh, we shall persevere and talk more home territory for us. So we have uh, the pixels coming in with a big feature drop, and that's really supposed to be kind of the rebranding of those uh, security updates that you get every month for the pixels. Uh, maybe uh, you might have heard of the pixel update bulletin and uh, not really the sexist, uh, sexy thing to do. It's not, it's not very, it's, it's, um, they haven't been really doing a good job at promoting what optimizations they've made. And given that uh, they are very much into the software Google is with their phones, uh, that's uh, that's an opportunity that they have not taken. So they're taking it now. In this particular update, uh, we're looking at RAM management uh, improvements. Inactive apps are being uh, compressed into the cache, which is great for all the apps that you are currently using. Uh, Pixel 4 is getting call screen uh, automatic detection of robocalls so that you don't even... It doesn't even ring when... Uh, uh, a robocall gets to you. It just goes to call screen automatically, and then afterwards you can pick up the transcript and uh, see if it's actually a call that was worth of, something of value to you. Uh, Google well, Photo. And if, also, if uh, the Pixel 4 detects that the call is legitimate, it will then forward it on to you. Uh, yeah, that's that's something that 
um, worth pointing out. Uh, Google Photos. Google Photos is uh, getting uh, background blurring for any photo now. So it's not just um, it, it, post processing is uh, the key word for it. Uh, and if your camera has some sort of data, uh, depth data that the app can utilize, then that's going to be useful to uh, the app. But if not, um, you'll just have to, you know, try it out manually. You'll have to, there are like sliders and whatnot for that. But other than that, you know, it's uh, that, that can be an automatic process if the data is there. And then you got a few big uh, improvements to Google Duo. Not sure if, uh, I haven't actually used Duo uh, in quite a while. Have you? Uh, only when I do teardowns. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, honestly, only it, it's the only time I ever do video chats. It, otherwise, it never touch it. Maybe next time we can uh, hold our calls via Duo because here we got on the Pixel Four at least ninety hertz support. So that fluid motion that you'll you'll enjoy from uh, your relatives when you're just calling to check on them, like ninety hertz, fascinating. Um, we got the AI improvements. Basically, if the uh, connection that you're on is spotty and uh, things are cutting out, the AI, um, AI, excuse me, can generate something of the next sound it thinks you'll you would have made in between the cutouts. So, if I, you know, say apple, pu you know, and uh, it cuts out, then it might say uh, the AI might kick in and say. I apple pie is right. what I was trying to say. Honestly, I'm I'm very curious. I at some point I hope they do sort of a real demo of this because I want to know is it actually going to try to simulate your voice? Because obviously this is supposed to fill in people's speech. Is it actually going to deliver something that sounds like your voice or is it going to kind of just mush it out a little so it still sounds kind of right but not exactly you know i i want to know how close this gets and I'm, will people be able to tell i'm waiting for google to uh deep fake me so that uh, they can use my voice for all their ethical projects um, hey keep it, it like they say the uh the the best technology out there is indiscernible for magic and <laughs> Uh, it, to be fair, like the things that are the most abusable are also the things that can lead to the best features. Fame, uh, the best example of this is actually Google Voice. All of the things that spammers use to harass you, to fake calls coming from other phone numbers, all that stuff, is all the same stuff Google Voice was using so that calls coming into Google Voice actually rang through as the original caller when they got forwarded to you and a lot of stuff like that. So, you know. It, so watch this deep fakes will be their next like no no we're uh, we're just gonna fix video calls for you we're just gonna deep fake everything so as long as we kind of know what's being said you'll get you'll get a perfect call magic and exploitability I, I i remember a song talking about uh believing in magic in a young girl's heart and um there's like there's th that gives me a lot of creepy vibes going on there so um uh no thank you um and then we also have a duo uh, supporting uh, live background blurring for the pixels two, three, and four. So uh, basically, this is my untidy bedroom. And th if this call were being held on duo right now, this video call were being held on duo right now, you will not see the messy um, um, wardrobe thing that I have back there. And um, that would be great. Thank you uh, very much. So. <laughs> We got um, a few more things that we could talk about, but uh, I'm wondering how good of a job this does. This this features drop is like is this a good marketing or a good show of support or like what what is this for Google? Uh well, so I'm coming at uh, I look at this from definitely the wrong perspective. I fully admit that uh, coming from the place of having done tons of teardowns, having dug into AOSP source code for these types of, uh, or for the, um, for the monthly updates, so on and so forth. 
to me, I know that these feature drops are not really tied to the monthly update. And I, I know that these are just app updates that they're choosing. They're they're making an, a real decision to release everything all, all at the same time, kind of in sync. And so in my mind, it, I mean, it's not a bad thing. Uh, and in general, I kind of like it. But at this, and I think for regular people, it's probably good because when you release a few different things all at once, it makes for good messaging. When you release like one new feature in a given week and then nothing around it, a lot of times that actually does kind of get buried by the news because uh, if it was something like the the enhancements to Duo, honestly, none of this is stuff anyone's going to write news about. Not really. I mean, there'd be an article that would quickly get forgotten and people would move on. But the fact that it's next to the Pixel 4 call screen happening automatically, uh, forget it. Like that, that alone will carry a story. People want to read about that. People care about that. And uh, speaking as the owner of multiple pixels, people will be angry that it isn't happening on the three and two. Just saying. Yeah. A little salt about that because holy crap, I need it so bad. <laughs> wow, well, um, you, you didn't buy a, a phone this year, a Pixel phone from Google this year. Um, Yabu sucks to be you. <laughs> well, I, I have a four also. It's just not my main line. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I, I realize that, but uh, you know, still, it's. Uh, I yeah. think that's the kind of. Uh, it's it's part of the upgrade cycle that Google wants to juice up, and uh, unfortunately, it's done pretty badly. Uh, when it comes to uh, its sales channels and its pricing and its discounts, uh, not not a good job there. So it's uh, unfortunate for them, but um, um, so goes uh, Google's siloing of uh, all of its departments. So, so I guess there's that. How do you feel about this messaging? Do you think it's uh, the right way to deliver the features, the messaging about the new features? I think uh, when it comes to a lot of these massive use or what's intended to be mass use apps, having, I don't think we should set expectations for some of these features uh, or these features at all to appear with each monthly update. It's not, not, um, not like Google should be teasing, hey, next month we'll be bringing this. But I feel like having, if you're working on projects, uh, for these features, if you're the developing team for this, it's nice to have a good deadline to work towards. And I think, you know, just putting as many features and shoving it into uh, this monthly update as possible is uh, generally, I think, you know, it, it goes some ways to bring bringing uh, all the departments into line. And perhaps we could get more synch uh, synchronicity, uh, more cooperation i guess um when uh future d updates come along but um that's just me and my fancy little wonderland um hoping that's all <laughs> yeah that's pretty fair uh but yeah overall uh i i give them credit at least they're at least they're getting stuff out and I, I think I also want to give him credit for actually promoting some of these features a little better than they normally would, because mm. some of this stuff, again, uh, even Google hasn't always been very good about acknowledging new features and changes. So uh, if their if their apps are coming out and actually have these notable enhancements hitting, at least they're giving some sort of outlet for that. That is a, that is a good outlet, um, and I think when it comes to uh, giving credit, I think we should uh, tell people to give us credit um, just a little bit. I mean, and you, it doesn't have to be ours uh, or yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, indeed. So if you're listening to us now, we are the Android Police. Uh, this is our <laughs> podcast, and it is on Twitch four times a week. It's actually three times a week with the podcast and then a Q&A show that happens on Tuesday. Uh, and we can't do this without your support. And by support, what we really mean is money. Uh, the best way to show your support to Android Police is with a subscription. The subscriptions can actually be done through Twitch Prime if you are an Amazon Prime member. Or uh, you can also pay $5 a month to Twitch and uh, 
become a subscriber. We also appreciate bits. That's uh, basically money that gets donated in small denominations. And as a subscriber, you also get free entries into AP giveaways. You get access to the infamous Ryan emoji, which shows him in his happiest state ever. And uh, again, you're showing you're showing you care. You're showing you like us. You're showing that we mean more to you than just that random thing that you listen to for free. <laughs> <laughs> when you said we are the Android police, I really, I wish uh, actual police actually greeted um, me when I was, uh, you know, speeding or something like that. Like, just we are the Android police. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that. Um, so anyway. If you'd like to find out any more about this, you can go to twitch.tv slash Android Police. There are instructions on the page. Uh, you can also hit up androidpolice.com and find the donate button. That'll uh, that'll send some money in the direction of the site. And, uh, and again, thank you for coming by and supporting us. We appreciate it. We like you for it. So uh, <laughs> please do that. So one of uh, Killbot is uh, asking whether or not uh, we should update our uh, notch. Our sub whenever someone gives us money, uh, there's the freaking Pixel Three XL notch that comes down and gives everyone basically the you know, hey, here's this person that donated to us. And um, I don't know, should we do something different next year? Uh, so. Uh the the going theory is at least for right now i think we're going to probably keep it uh at least a while longer my my vote which is born both of laziness and because i think the meme is too good to let it go this easily but my vote would be when google decides to abandon the uh the pixel 3 we will abandon the notch mm, when when support officially ends for the pixel 3 will we will also in support for the pixel three so that's another two years from now huh? eh, roughly yeah somewhere in that territory um and that being said uh if something better comes along oh yeah obviously it's going to be like a week and we'll have something better but <laughs> you know it, perhaps what, what can i say we're fickle I know, we, we should just we will 100% abandon something if uh, if something more memeable and more fun comes along. I mean, I'm willing to go for the S11 Plus camera hump, but uh, you know that's uh, that's just me. The S11 Plus camera hump. Oh, you haven't seen it? You, I know I have. <laughs> Here we go. Here, let, let, let me load up the page. Load up the search results for it. Uh, and uh, oh, here it comes. That would look, yeah, that would not, <laughs> that would be just super weird on the page or it, when a subscriber hits and it doesn't really have a ton of space for, I mean, depending on how big we make it, but then it's just like a mess. That's going to cover the lock. faces, everyone. Let's, let's be honest about this. It's just going to be, yeah. Whoosh. No, if, if anything, uh, I'm thinking we could do actually, you know, the uh the one plus eight light it has a nice rounded camera module that could float down it's just not attached to the top you know that could work okay all right maybe i was thinking uh, but, of, like actually like moving it to like a different side so that it has to come in faster it has to like whack you in the face figuratively uh well why why shouldn't we could just invest in a robot with an actual like hand and every time we get a subscription it just comes across wax us in the face <laughs> uh, uh at the very dude. least we could put that in uh ryan's apartment <laughs> <laughs> i'll i'll do that when i uh next visit him but uh even even when he's not the one on the show with us Every time somebody subscribes, he'll he'll just be sitting there. All of a sudden, he'll be working and whack. Well, it's every time you put down the emote that it goes whack. Ooh, ooh. See, that's I can a make if this happen. That's an if recipe that uh, needs going. That needs to be cooked up. Um, <laughs> speaking of cooking up, let's uh, cook up something else. Let's cook up an update on how 
Stadia is doing uh, weeks into its semi-public launch here. Indeed. If you've been watching the site, you may have noticed that our uh, three-week update review just uh, just popped out earlier today, I believe it was. Uh, that was written by Taylor, who unfortunately couldn't join us on the podcast today. He's very but, shy. Yeah, yeah, he's he's not a fan of this medium um, or being on this medium. I have no idea whether or not he likes our podcast. I don't know if he listens. Shame on him if he doesn't. But screw you, uh, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, he brought up a number of topics that uh, he's he's had. Uh, he's had thoughts on basically that uh, latency and stream quality have actually held up, at least on Destiny 2. And he's mentioned a couple of other games. Uh, I Well, he mentioned Red Dead Redemption in the post, and then we've talked about a few other games outside of that just in the chat room. And yeah, everything has been performing really well. Uh, he, he did mention, of course, the story about uh, Chromecast Ultra's overheating. It hasn't been an issue for him. I haven't had this issue either. Uh, so seems to the going theory. I think a lot of us have is that people are placing their ultras in not very well ventilated places. So yeah. they're just not really having an opportunity to evacuate the heat. Yeah. Um, and, well, I mean, and there's also the option for ethernet too, if uh, they really uh, want to cool those radios down, but uh I don't know that Ethernet's actually making a difference. And honestly, yeah. I, I don't think it has anything to do with the radio. I know I've heard that theory kind of circulating, but pretty I'm pretty sure it's actually the uh, chips inside. Well, you've heard the fans circulating, so I'm not sure if uh, they're trying to get you. Anyway. Uh, Drum roll, still... please. No, it's a, it's a rim shot. Darn it. Okay, go right. ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Anyway, uh, so also... Um, They've launched a few of the, the a few of the features, not many, but a few of those things that were kind of supposed to be there at launch or most people expected. Uh, for example, the Google Assistant button now actually can do something, though very, very little. Uh, they've actually added, uh, I believe it's just one new game since launch. Uh, Darksiders, maybe I'm Dark wrong. Maybe yeah, Darksiders. Uh, they do now have the web store actually up and running, which uh, we'll we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and basically, overall, Stadia is actually performing now that there are lots of people playing on it. And it's not really clear exactly how many, but numbers have been thrown around that uh, lands it somewhere in the. Are we uh, talking about four digits or five digits, maybe? Uh, my understanding is mid to upper five digits. Okay, that's worldwide. that's a fair. That's or a well, fair. Uh, among the countries where it launched, so uh, it's super unclear how accurate those numbers are. But one way or another, it's actually doing well, and I've been playing it. Taylor's been playing. Uh, uh, I think actually in total there are five or six people at AP who are playing either via Buddy Pass or mm -hmm. uh, Founders. And, Why haven't I received a buddy pass? Huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so far, I, I've only heard one person actually complain in any meaningful way. And it's only because he's unhappy with the exact resolution that's coming across. Otherwise, everybody else has been pretty much saying it's performing great for them. Uh, exact obviously, the resolution like or, is, well, he, is he getting like 27 12 by 13 82 or something not actually resolution it's uh complaints that the compression is not the way that he would like to see it which uh, uh what i think he's actually complaining about is upscaling which would be a resolution issue i don't think he's actually complaining about uh artifacting but anyway um so uh yeah I mean, so far, my opinion on Stadia is it's it's actually living up to the promises pretty well. I I would say I could be playing for uh, I could play for four to six hours and maybe see one glitch. Like one noticeable wow. glitch. I, I wouldn't be surprised that there's a very rare occasional frame drop here and there. But for the most part, I can't tell. And notably, this is also what I've seen 
using a Chromecast Ultra on a TV. If you're playing in a web browser it, or in Chrome, uh, it's not as good. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, there's no denying it's not as good in Chrome. That's that's the thing. I don't think it's really being talked about enough, but uh, you you definitely get a degraded video and performance is usually not as good either. Well, I mean, the storytelling is becoming more and more a crucial part of these games. And uh, when it comes to details, compression is going to be a big factor in, I guess, how people visually enjoy a product. So um, are you... Like, do you pay uh, particular attention to like visual details, or are you listening more to uh, dialogue, or like what what what's what's in it for you when it comes to these sorts of games? Uh, well, it, it depends on the game. Um, I mean, it, obviously, it's going to depend a lot on the game. Yeah. Uh, the the game that I have enjoyed the most over the last quite a few years has been The Last of Us. It's mm -hmm. a uh, Sony PlayStation exclusive. Uh, anyone who's listened to me on the Q&A show has heard me talk about this more than a couple times. But that game is, I mean, it's visually very good at times, but way more importantly, it's fundamentally huge on storytelling. And it is super, super good at that. Uh, then yeah, they bl block a lot of shots like a TV drama would. And they got a good variety of... Uh of uh you know close-ups mediums and wides and um there's just there there are a lot of things that uh, can kind of capture your eye in each of those scenes right uh it does definitely um uh though if we're talking about visuals and i i'm not saying that this is going to be the best example but destiny 2 is one of those games that actually does kind of ride on visuals a decent amount um more more with like the big huge background scenes but uh it's really heavily focused on like massive scale it really wants you to feel like you're a small part of a very big world mm -hmm. uh so um you know lots of bright colors fine details in some things obviously other things not as fine a detail but uh you know it, again it it depends on games sometimes you really care about the visuals other times who who could care, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, uh, sort of like uh, I want to say the name of the game is super hot. Do I have that? Yeah, right? it's super hot. Yeah, not that's not a visually stunning game. I mean, not in the sense of like big, gorgeous graphics, but uh, at the, the same the, time, the stunning thing is the motion. <laughs> is exactly. The motion part of it. Yeah. And you're delivering something interesting, actually, almost through the lack of graphics. So. Again, it just depends on on game. Sometimes you really need the graphics. Other times you can do it as simply as that. Well, just I guess um, I'm not particularly sure how the uh, servers are configured, but uh, let's kind of hope that server loads are manageable for anyone who is playing um, uh, kind of uh, Destiny Two or or those types. Because um, if you I, Maybe if you play it more, um, or if more people play it, then it's just not going to end up looking the best. But hmm. yeah, so um, circling back around briefly to the web store, uh, a story just today, or well, actually, initially the the details came out a few days ago, but uh, we we just hit it today. Um, some people did a little bit of. Uh, experimenting with the urls and found out or, or came across a ton of different lists that the uh that stadia is going to be displaying to people at various times um this includes uh 56 different genres of games uh, though there's a lot of overlap here so 56 is a bit of an exaggeration because you end up with things like uh horror games survival games and survival horror games those are three different genres so uh, you know just just to give context to this there are definitely some overlaps here um oh and i love this action games adventure games and action adventure games totally yeah. dead serious these are some of them there's but a slash between them Ugh. yeah th there are some interesting ones in here there are categories like visual novel uh which 
you don't really think too often that that's going to be coming up as a game type. Um, there well, have are, you seen uh, the the weeaboos and koreaboos and like those types of people? Like those, oh, for they sure. really value their visual novels. It's pretty good stuff. Uh, and and another category which you don't really necessarily think too much about, though, if you just look around a little bit on Steam, you'll certainly find plenty of it. Dating simulations, which I think is I think it's interesting. Stadia has already made a point of having a category for this. Uh, notably, none of these lists are actually live yet. Um, they are, uh, they're basically empty lists at the moment. You can visit the URL. You can see that it's actually there, but you can't actually, uh, or, or there's nothing in the list yet. Um, I'm still waiting for, uh, dating sim generator games to be able to be played so that we can get, uh, the Gordon Ramsay, Paula Dean dating sim on Stadia. It's you're going to have to see it for yourself. I'm sorry. I, I'm so confused by this. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh boy. Uh, hitting hitting a couple of these others. There were actually a few uh, really interesting highlights because this exposed a few things that hadn't really previously been known. Uh, for example, there's a list of publishers. Five of the publishers publishers here have games either already in the store or are known to be coming. Like, you know, 2K is bringing Borderlands 3. Uh, Square Enix already has Final Fantasy in there. Or Final Fantasy 15. Um, one interesting one that doesn't have a game announced is Digital or uh, Devolver Digital, which uh, I'm suddenly drawing a blank on the exact name of what's coming, but they have an indie horror game that looks really, really neat, mm -hmm. uh, which is expected to be coming out to Stadia. Um, some of these lists also kind of reveal some upcoming features, including um, uh, they will have a wish list. Not too surprising there. Uh, you'll be able to pre-order games, which is kind of a staple with the gaming industry these days. Uh, you're also going to have lists of games that are available as demos and trials, which, uh, come on, with Stadia being what it is, there was no way that wasn't going to happen. But everyone's been asking, like, when is it going to happen? Will we see these? And, you know, at, at least that's kind of confirmation. It's definitely going to happen. Uh, Quote, unquote, and, soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one said soon. But anyway, soon in the relative uh, history of uh, humans. <laughs> yeah. But uh, regardless, th this is another set of the sort of we know it's coming. And so Stadia is still on its way to delivering the seemingly endless list of stuff we know is coming and just don't really know when. So I guess the natural lead off from here is does what you see here, like, should that encourage developers um, to continue or to at least keep themselves interested in Stadia, barring any major kind of F-ups later on? Uh, you know, my, my thought on that is actually kind of a pretty straightforward, if you're a developer, as long as it's not going to cost you too much, you're you're dumb if you don't get on stadia it, it's not that you're necessarily like losing out on anything massive but you could be you have no idea and that's kind of the issue you could stand the chance of putting your game on stadia there might be a lot of people who actually see value in it and want you know want to buy your game and play it on stadia maybe maybe your audience is a bunch of people who don't really get into buying consoles or or pc games uh, if you don't take that opportunity, I think you're nuts. Uh, it, it may be a waste of time for you. It may not be a hugely profitable venture, but the room is there. Like to me, it, it just makes financial sense to try it. And a zero to 10, 10 being most likely. What is uh, your uh, hunch on Google shutting this down? <laughs> on what timeline? Uh, just, um, I guess so. Uh, we'll say within a year. Oh, within a year, I I would say zero chance. Zero. I, I I honestly cannot even fathom them shutting this down within a year. 
because <laughs> look at look at the total catastrophe that was aloe and they kept that running way longer than they should have uh Stadia, they shut down things that like actually made sense and uh, you know the, google never really has a rhyme or reason for these things do they uh well typically typically the things that they've shut down with any sort of expediency it was stuff that was sort of destined to to hurt them either financially or by reputation and mm. so far i honestly they're walking into stadia w with almost a negative reputation already and I, there's almost nowhere to go but up <laughs> so uh they may as well just keep it going as long as they can keep delivering new features and possibly turning people to their side well, and if the... almost oh. everyone seems to be having a pretty good experience so far I, obviously there are exceptions especially people who uh have terrible internet connections it's just a reality but outside well, the... of that it's you know they've they've convinced certainly some people that this is a viable business streaming is game streaming is not actually a bad thing I mean, we'll have to see what the revenue base uh, says about that. But uh, if users, if publishers have confidence in that, then maybe developers are able to, um, you know, get in and uh, contribute whatever share that they need to uh, to Google. But yeah, still a uh, a big uh, TBA uh, over our heads over here. So we'll have to see what happens in January, whenever. In January, yeah, the they tier. they go public with the 1080p tier. So yeah, the the no monthly cost tier, which uh, you just buy the games and play at 1080p. And technically, there are there are a couple of other my mi relatively minor sacrifices to not being on a pro account. But I I think a lot of people are probably going to be jumping on that, which also worries me because uh, the the founders jumping on. That was a small number of people. I mean, realistically, and they had a little bit of growing pains during that first weekend. But I I think the number of people who are going to be jumping onto the free tier is going to be uh, in a, an insane scale. Uh, I'll, so uh, many uh, more people. I fully expect that there's going to be uh, what many um, new services come in uh, expect is that if you're or if you're from a well-established company, at least, is that they'll go really big for the, like the first week or so. And then they'll, you know, shrink down and then um, they'll just try and see if they can build from maybe like, I don't know, the half that remain from that big surge, maybe 40 percent. If it's even like 30 percent, then I would consider that somewhat of a victory is a little too strong of a word for it, but Hey, well, well truth we'll be told, see. I think a lot of the people who are going, who are going to hit in that first weekend or week or whatever, I think that's going to be a lot of people who would not have actually signed up to stadia anyway. They're, they're just going to kind of get on there just to try it literally mm -hmm. just to it because kind of, I don't want to say because they want to see a fail, but because they just want to see how close is this. And once I know, I'm going to go back to my local gaming anyway. Well, they still need to buy a game anyways. I mean, they're not playing Farm Simulator 19. <laughs> Un unless uh, demos and trials launch between now and then. <laughs> we'll see. You never know. How, they'll, they'll play like 15 minutes at, or like five minutes at a time. Oof, that's going to be rough. Well, in any case, uh, thank you for listening or watching. Uh, all the topics that we've talked about today can be found at androidpolice.com slash podcast. We are live four times a week at Android Police on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Android Police. And we would love to hear your thoughts. Send an email to podcast at androidpolice.com. On Twitter, Cody is at Cody underscore tombs, T W O M B S. Our producer, that's me, Jules Wong, is at Point Jules, and our theme music is by home. David is back on Wednesday with guest Hayata Huseman, my friend from Android Central. Until then, you can have yourself a great week, and we'll talk to you in a bit. <laughs>